Hello, everyone. My name is Joan Osato, and uh, my pronouns are she, hers. I am calling in from the uh, wonderfully beautiful uh, unceded lands of the Ramatuja Ohlone. Um, I work for an organization, You Speaks, in San Francisco, who is a proud NPN member. Uh, and I also have the extreme privilege of serving on the board of directors as its chair. Um, I wanted to welcome you all to NPN's virtual conference um, in 2022. I'm really glad you're all here. Um, as you know, uh, you all will get to meet each other, a wonder wonderful slate of presenters, as well as uh, wonderful artists who are a part of this conference. I really hope that you enjoy it. I really hope that you soak it in. And um, as noted, you know, be compassionate, drink water, take time when you need it. Um, but uh, uh, I know you're all coming with an open heart. Um, one of the things I wanted to um, ask you all today is that uh, uh, a kind of question and a prompt, which is, um, what burning questions do you bring into this conference? What do you want to know? Uh, what do you want to learn about? And the other thing is that since we've been all through this kind of seemingly in, endless pandemic together, um, and we've just entered a new year, it, what is the leaf that you're turning over in 2022? Hello, greetings, and welcome to the National Performance Network's 2022 virtual conference. I'm Caitlin Strokash, president and CEO of the National Performance Network, and I am joining you from New Orleans, the ancestral lands of the Atacapa Ishak, Caddo, Chitimacha, Choctaw, Homa, Natchez, and Tunica peoples, and the Petites Nations, this place called Bulbancha the land of many tongues. I am a white woman in my late 40s with a kind of queer glam punk aesthetic wearing black and with super short platinum hair that is definitely not my natural color. I am sitting in front of a wall size artwork of a shark with the word thank you in giant letters. Thank you for being here with us. Thank you for sharing your time, curiosity, energy, and wisdom in this community. Thank you for all you are bringing into this space over the next few days. Your joy, your rage, your questions and assertions, your challenges, possibilities, and dreams. It's been two years since we gathered our NPN community together. In November 2019 in New Orleans for our last annual conference, and in March 2020 at Martha's Vineyard for our last mid-year meeting, where we met with members of the Wampanoag tribal community and attended a performance by Malpaso Dance Company from Cuba just days before the U.S. began to shut down. The last two years have layered crisis on top of crisis the ongoing pandemic and its countless impacts, the racial uprisings in the aftermath of the murder of George Floyd and continued violence against communities of color, political upheavals, economic crises, hurricanes and fires and floods. There have been too many losses to name here, but we are still here. I am here, you are here, we are here. And it is our task, our challenge, our honor to carry on toward a more just future. Over the next few days, we'll hear from many of you about what you're thinking, dreaming up and working on. But I'd like to take a moment to share what NPN has been up to. At the start of the pandemic, there were two principles that guided us in that particularly cloudy time. First, that we know inequities are amplified in a crisis, even and maybe especially when that crisis seems to affect everyone. We know the gaps widen, 
the injustices deepen, and we committed to centering racial and cultural justice in our response to the pandemic, as in all our work. Second, we resisted a back to normal approach because the old normal was unjust and built on the backs of artists and communities of color in particular. So rather than join the call for back to normal, we have invested in a reimagining of our sector. NPN's mission has been a powerful roadmap for these last two years, and I am so grateful for the clarity it has offered us. Our two pillars, to build artists' power and to advance racial and cultural justice, guide everything we do. These are not two separate directives, they are intertwined. And beyond our individual programs, our mission aims us towards systems change for a more just and equitable world, which means engaging in movement building and ensuring NPN is a community of ongoing learning and practice together. Lastly, the way we go about this work is in our mission too, to foster relationships and reciprocity between individuals, institutions, and communities. We are more than a network of arts presenters more than a funder of artists, more than a service organization to our local community in New Orleans. NPN holds space in this messy, complicated intersection to build and claim our collective power for a more liberatory world. This period has shown a spotlight on what Ibram X. Kendi calls the conjoined twins of capitalism and racism, and NPN has taken a hard look at where we have fallen short, how we might respond quickly to meet urgent needs, and what long-term systems change that centers racial and economic justice looks like. Much of our recent work has focused on thriving wage and labor conditions for artists, led by initiatives like Creating New Futures, Working Artists for the Greater Economy, Dance Artists National Collective, We See You White American Theater, and other powerful collectives demanding more healthy, sustainable, and humane practices in our field. In many ways, this is a reaffirmation of what NPN was founded to do when our network first came together in 1985 to establish better wage conditions for performing artists. And as the majority of NPN's regranting funds and subsidies directly support artists, we've unraveled much of our own assumptions and bureaucracy <laughs> these last two years to get resources to artists as quickly and flexibly as possible, including three new grant programs supporting artists of color in Louisiana, Alabama, and Mississippi. In addition to these necessary and overdue shifts for greater economic justice for artists, we've seen important progress in support for organizations of color as well, like challenging philanthropy to trust and invest in folks who have been doing the work in communities of color all along. The donations made by Mackenzie Scott last June, $2.8 billion to arts and cultural organizations underscored this principle, trust organizations of color with significant unrestricted funds to do what they know how to do. I burst into tears when I saw that list. So many of our peer organizations like Alternate Roots, the International Association of Blacks and Dance, NALOC, First Peoples Fund, and on and on, getting the recognition they have long deserved. And five, five NPN partners on that list, Junebug Productions, The Theater Offensive, Youth Speaks, all of whom are represented on our board of directors, by the way, Ashe Cultural Arts Center, and Guadalupe Cultural Arts Center. Three of those have also been part of NPN's Leveraging a Network for Equity program, which has been a phenomenal model to create the conditions in which arts organizations of color and rural organizations self-determine a thriving future. I am so proud of the work we have done, even as we continue to challenge ourselves to go deeper and dream bigger. This conference is about all these forces driving our work today, but it's also about the future we can build together. As we've shifted this past year from a time of acute emergency to a sustained liminal period, 
We've asked ourselves what it means to practice justice in an ongoing state of disruption. Our programming throughout the conference is intended as a call and response to this very question. The answers are here among us in the wisdom and imagination and ferocity of this group of artists, organizers, presenters, curators, funders, leaders, and learners. I am so grateful to be in this virtual space with y'all. We have three incredible keynotes lined up, as well as creative workshops, brilliant breakouts, and more than 20 artist showcases planned. The NPN staff and board have put together a wonderful show, and I'm excited to share it with you. Without further ado, it is my honor to pass the mic to Christopher K. Morgan, one of our incredible board members, to guide us in our opening keynote about Indigenous guiding principles, how we gather. Awaken. E ala e kahiki kue ala e kahiki moi. Awaken where the heavens stand, awaken where the heavens lie to go to sleep. E ala ho ia uahiki mai oi. I also awaken with your coming. Ua la ka la ni ua la ka honua. The sky awakens. The earth awakens. Ua la ka uka ua la ke kai. It stirs where the mountain meets the sea. A kahi e ke aloha i hiki mai ai. Today arrives the first pang of aloha, of love. Aloha y'all. My name is Christopher Kawi Morgan and I'm so honored to share space as we begin the National Performance Network's virtual conference together. I am a brown-skinned man with closely shaved dark brown hair and brown eyes. I'm wearing a black and gold patterned shirt, and I'm sitting in a white room with two bright green plants behind me. My pronouns are he, his, him. My sign name, a dancing letter C, was given to me by deaf students that I taught dance to in Poland back in 1997. I am the son of Mona Kauka, a Kanaka Maoli or Native Hawaiian, Chinese and German woman who left her home of Honolulu, Hawaii in 1953, enlisting in the US Marines with a friend shortly after they graduated high school. She studied electrical engineering while learning about segregation during boot camp in Mississippi. After her time in the service, Mona accomplished many things in her life, not the least of which was raising eight children. I'm the youngest. I am the son of Charles Morgan, a Kanaka Maoli or Native Hawaiian, Japanese, German, and Irish man who left the small fishing village of Ka'a'ava on Oahu in 1952, when he enlisted in the U.S. Marines as well. After serving in the Korean War, he became a barber. My father credits his early adopter Japanese customers with building his clientele in the 1950s and 60s, at a time when other customers refused to sit in his chair because he was mixed race. Some of these early customers received haircuts from my father for 50 years. My mother and father met and married in California, where my siblings and I were raised. And though we were far from the islands that my parents grew up in, we were raised with values that I later came to realize are inherently Hawaiian. This grew a deep love for Hawaii in me. I am queer and married. I'm a dance maker and storyteller, a stone collector, an aspiring lay maker, a connector, a bridge builder. And I gather people to do all of this work. I'm an introvert by nature, but an extrovert by calling. 
I am not a kumuhula, the Hawaiian title for master teacher. I am a student of Hawaiian culture. I'm not a scholar in any field. I am a practitioner. I'm not a native expert. I am native. I'm one person sharing my perspectives, approaches, learning, and questions. And I'm really privileged to have a platform to speak to you today. I'm streaming from my home in Tacoma Park, Maryland, on land that was stolen from the Nacotchtank, Piscataway, Pamunkey, and Powhatan peoples, amongst many other Native communities whose histories have been obscured, altered, or erased. Tacoma Park is just outside the U.S. capital of Washington, D.C., which compels me to acknowledge that the establishment of the United States was financed by the sale of enslaved humans and built with their forced labor. I believe we have a collective responsibility for that history and for how we respond to continued acts of marginalization and oppression. And I invite us all to take a moment to consider the legacy of colonization and ableism embedded within the technologies, structures, and ways of thinking that many of us use every day. That includes the high-speed internet and computer equipment we're utilizing now that's not available to so many. I invite you to join me in acknowledging all of this, and I ask, how can we individually and collectively with the power of this network work towards reconciliation, justice, and healing. I commit myself to this work and am so grateful that the National Performance Network has demonstrated their commitment to this difficult, crucial work over the many years I have known the network as an artist, as a former director of a partner venue, and as a board member. We heard such clear testimony from Caitlin as to the ways that NPN has been doing that work recently. And so again, aloha everyone, e komo mai, or welcome. If you haven't already, I invite you to identify yourself in the chat. I also ask you to share one way that you have continued working towards justice in this time of disruption and our evolving ways of working and gathering. So today's subject, how we gather Indigenous guiding principles, is a small facet of NPN's commitment to practicing justice. From discussions I had with Caitlin a couple months ago, we intend today's keynote to be part of a series of sessions over the course of the next year to re-Indigenize our work. Our shared commitment is key in this work. And utilizing this session as an example of Indigenous informed gathering, I'm going to take a moment to reflect on how I introduced myself just now. In order to gather for this moment, all of us across digital space, it was important to me that first I welcome you with an oli, a chant in the traditions of my people and culture, that I identify myself by way of my family, that I further identify myself to provide context to those of you attending this gathering, and that I acknowledge the land that I am on. These model some of the ways Indigenous folks introduce themselves in gatherings and create connection and context. In-depth introductions can inform all of our gatherings, regardless of where we are and who is being convened. And while this models some Indigenous ways, I want to be clear that the approaches, ideas, and questions that I and my guests share today are not the model, they're not the template. They are offerings that require interpretation, thought, care, and action. I think a good example of this is how um, there's never a one-size-fits-all challenge that I face every time I draft a land acknowledgement for discussions or panels that I'm part of. 
Frequently, I try to copy a welcome and land acknowledgement that I wrote and utilized previously, but copy paste never works. Indeed, there are consistent elements, but each gathering requires unique preparation. And this is something I hope I can offer today. A reminder that the work of gathering is new and different every single time. The participants change both in demographics and as individuals. The atmosphere may shift, the day's news has impacted us, the weather may have lifted us or washed us clean or made our commute stressful. And just like live performance is never the same twice, or how you can never copy paste the same answers between two different grant applications, though I certainly wish I could, every single curtain speech, every welcome, every introduction is unique. Today, addressing this incredible network of humans who support, create, and facilitate art making and activism is so inspiring for me. Many of you I call friends, and whether or not I know you personally, I know that you are holding so much. Our ways of gathering, as Caitlin said, have been drastically altered. You have seen incredible loss. You have been rescheduling and reimagining. You've been having difficult conversations and making even more difficult decisions. I recently saw a meme that said, we should all assume that anyone who has survived these past two years is exhausted. And while the community gathered today is no exception to this exhaustion, I also know that all of you continue to support, foster, create, and dream up opportunities for gathering. Thank you. I see you. And it felt really necessary that that acknowledgement be part of how we, all of us, gather today. And before moving into the Indigenous guiding principles, I must reflect on the pandemic and its profound impact on in-person gathering. So many organizations and businesses, including ones we all work in, have been developing remote work guidelines since the onset of the pandemic. And with each rise and fall of the pandemic, the media promotes our return to work. This is a term I don't understand, as I know most of us gathered here have only been working harder since the pandemic took hold of our communities. But if I accept that term, return to work, well, what if that return to work were infused with indigenous values and art heart passion? What if that return to work centered social justice and fought for a balance between communal gathering and alone time? What if it lifted up the needs of families and caretakers of all kinds? And while virtual fatigue is real, I think the pandemic has provided us a unique opportunity to ask ourselves good and difficult questions about in-person gathering. Here are three questions I want to pose to ground our thinking today. First, what do we yearn for in public gatherings? In this moment of reimagining our gathering spaces and events, can we fulfill the desires of our art hearts more fully while working in ways that can better care for the arts workers and communities engaged in making the work? Can we integrate indigenous values and leadership to more mindfully fulfill our creative yearnings together? My second question for today, what is missing in our expanded virtual lives? While some virtual presentations have sometimes been frustrating facsimiles for in-person gathering, there's no denying that there have been incredible works of art made to be consumed from our own homes. And virtual gathering has created an incredible and important increase in accessibility. Yet there's still a need for live gathering can we fulfill what we are missing in our virtual lives with a fresh re-envisioned in-person gathering that is complementary to the virtual offerings that we all have access to now? 
my third question. What is worthy of our collective time and energy that we must gather in person? Every facet of entertainment is transforming, from movies being released via streaming platforms to shopping malls shifting their focus to experiences. It behooves all of us in this network to deeply consider what actually is worthy of our collective time and energy that we must show up in person for it. While I work to answer these questions for myself, I invite all of us to approach our in-person convenings with these questions ruminating in the background. And for me, how we address these questions is at the heart of how we advance our field in a pandemic and endemic COVID-19 era. It's my hope that these evolutions include strength and foundations of equity and justice. To frame what's coming a little later, I want to think through three spectrums with you. Gathering to meetings, community building to streamline communication, and culture sharing to information sharing. I think one of my friends might drop those three things in the chat, and we'll pull that slide up again later for reference. So in thinking about gatherings to meetings, meetings have agendas and purpose. Sometimes a gathering has an agenda and purpose, but often the intent of gathering is simply being together. A gathering might encompass elements of a meeting, but a meeting is always a gathering. I'm gonna say that again. A gathering might encompass elements of a meeting, but a meeting is always a gathering. For those of us who frequently operate in fast paced capitalist structures, Toggling along the spectrum is an invitation to slow down, to get to know people. From the largest scale spectacle performance to the most intimate sight responsive piece for an audience of one. From a full conference gathering like this to a staff meeting. Infusing our business meetings with principles of gathering can be transformative. It makes me think about communication transformation that I've seen in colleagues. Many of you are likely familiar with Liz Lerman's critical response process, a form I'm very familiar with, utilize and sometimes even offer to other people. I've seen transformation in people's communication, even when they're not formally engaged in the critical response process. If we toggle along the spectrum of gatherings and meetings, having our gathering tools inform meetings, how might all of these be better? I'm going to say it one more time. While a gathering might encompass elements of a meeting, a meeting is always a gathering. My Western side struggles with that sometimes. Community building to streamlining communication. We've all had the experience where a meeting veers off topic, and this can be incredibly frustrating. I know I'm guilty of this in meetings. And perhaps we've also had the experience where that tangent germinates new ideas, transformation, or even fun. Again, for those of us who frequently operate in fast-paced capitalist structures, communication often prizes efficiency but sometimes communication that takes its own path is in service of something else. And I think fondly of the late Baba Melvin Deal, who joined the ancestors last year. So Baba Melvin was one of the Dance Africa DC elders and part of our council of elders at Dance Place where I used to work. Baba Melvin is one of the most fabulous educators, choreographers, guiding hands that I've ever had the pleasure of knowing. Our elders council meetings often struggle to complete their agendas because he needed to share stories with us. His anecdotes always enrich the group, both as individuals and our community. And in those moments, he was building us up as a community. And while inefficient, something much greater was at work. And since he's passed to the ancestral realm, I'm more appreciative of those moments than ever. He was making community. 
culture sharing to information sharing. All right, this is related. While fast and efficient communication via a multitude of technologies abounds, and we refine meetings to become increasingly efficient, perhaps we can also monitor where those efficiencies impact our stamina and patience for creative process, community building, and ritual. I don't know about you, but my stamina and patience has really shifted since the pandemic. And I'm someone who loves creative process and seeing things unfold slowly. We can remind ourselves and each other that disseminating information does not move at the same pace as building relationships and sharing culture. That taking the time to learn about different communities and their speed of trust is critical in building lasting relationships. So I offer that many of the principles, these indigenous gathering principles, as I see them, they're not groundbreaking. Many of them are not uniquely indigenous, maybe none of them. But I have witnessed firsthand that many of you in your organizations practice wonderfully thoughtful ways of gathering that incorporate several of these approaches. I've learned so much from many of my native colleagues who I'll honor and name later. As I drafted this working list of guiding principles for gathering, for me, they kind of all fit into three key areas. These are listening, asking questions, and showing respect. Again, like I said, nothing groundbreaking there, right? We'll break them down a little bit. I attempt to bring these principles into the many facets of my own work. Sometimes I succeed, often I fail. Sometimes certain guidelines take priorities over others. Other times they balance and harmoniously work together. And sometimes I'm having a bad day and I can't listen to anything but my own needs. And in those moments, I really need to halt the acronym H-A-L-T. And I need to address each letter of that acronym. Am I hungry? Am I angry? Am I lonely? Am I tired? Can I mitigate those things to be more in line with my goals? So these principles are common threads that I've encountered, and I'm sure many of you have your own experiences, ideas, and protocols that you will add to these, and you may want to remove some of mine. But with all of that in mind, here are some guidelines in these three areas of listen, ask questions, and show respect. First, with listening. Listen to land, listen to natural elements, listen to ancestors, listen to elders, listen to community, listen to children. Quiet the mind and listen to your instinct and heart. I invite you to observe your reaction to this listen list. Personally, my own impatience often has me missing much of what the natural environment has to say to me. Perhaps you can recall personal experiences you have had where the natural elements or the land itself have spoken to you. Has a shift in the wind ever given you pause? Has the weather changed your plans? Where something unexpectedly reminded you of an ancestor and it impacted your decision making? And have the results of these shifts ever brought something new and wonderful? By listening, can we tune into that more? Ask questions and do your own research. Whose land am I on? Who lives here now? What happened to the land's original inhabitants? Are they still in the area? Where are they now? Who might I build a relationship with from the local and original native communities? 
who might I ask to honor the original inhabitants and or local native communities? How do I remunerate them for their time and expertise? With so much displacement of native communities, it's important to acknowledge that the native people where you are may not be the original caretakers of that land. And with all of these questions, it's helpful to take on the labor of initial research to answer our own questions before asking them of people who may be exhausted from educating folks about as you find initial answers, stop and ask more questions. What are the protocols for being on this land? What are the protocols when visiting and speaking with elders? What are the rituals that can be shared? What actions, words, or objects might be taboo or offensive? What are the political dynamics between communities? And these comments or questions rather, I'm reminded of something Alicia Adams, the Vice President of International Programming and Dance at the Kennedy Center said during an APAP session a few years ago. Um, Alicia said that she often reminds her staff in preparing to welcome Native artists that these are international artists. And so the same linguistic and cultural preparation is needed for Native folks as is needed for folks traveling from Africa, Asia, Europe, or South America. The next set is show respect. Again, not groundbreaking, but warm welcome reminders. Observe the actions of the people who are part of the community and follow their example. Listen more than you speak. Listen for what people don't say with their words and learn reasons why people might be afraid to speak up. Ask questions where you hear the space open for it. Ask permission to share a story. Engage in appreciation and appropriate sharing, not appropriation. When listening for space to open for you to insert your voice, I ask us all to consider our privileges. Privileges of gender, race, ethnicity, ability, perceived power, and others that I haven't identified. And how those privileges often result in the same voices speaking first, loudest, and most often. I hope these guidelines are seen as an invitation and contribute to the ongoing range of work that I already know is happening in this network from artists and partners who are so steeped in the work they are beyond these invitations to those who are just beginning to expand their current ways of working. And everything I just shared is gathered in a document that's going to be dropped into the chat. Critical to the transformation of our field is investing in native leadership. And we're gonna take a look at two interviews that I did with incredible native leaders. These are artists whose work you should know if you don't already. They share their practices and some of their experiences within and outside of institutions that I hope shed some light on our collective work. Though I've only had the pleasure of knowing Ashley Minner for a few years, in that short time, I always long to know her better. I find that as an artist and administrator, she gracefully brings her indigeneity into native, non-native and mixed spaces with such care and integrity. Enjoy, and I'll be back with you in just over 15 minutes. Mahalo, thank you. Aloha, Ashley, and welcome. Thank you so much for joining me for this conversation. Hello, Christopher. Thank you so much for having me. So if we could just begin with whatever type of introduction of yourself you'd like to do for us, I'd greatly appreciate that. My name is Ashley Minner. My pronouns are she, her, and hers. I'm a community-based visual artist and folklorist from Baltimore, Maryland, and uh, my day job, I'm an assistant curator for history and culture at the Smithsonian National Museum of the American Indian. 
And you come to this conversation partly because of your tribal affiliation. So could you share with me your tribal affiliation and any particular welcome or greeting that you feel compelled to share with us? How could I have forgotten? I'm an enrolled <laughs> member of the Lumbee tribe of North Carolina and how y'all doing? <laughs> Perfect. Well, um, I'm so grateful to be in conversation with you because of the many hats that you wear. Um, I feel like we have a lot in common in that way. And when I think about you and your work um, and its many facets, something that always occurs to me is how you center many voices, many community members in your work. And I wondered if to help get us to know you and your work a little better, you could tell us about some of the elders in your life that have influenced you and how that connects to the work that you do now. That's a great uh, question. I grew up and still live in, uh, I've lived on the same block my entire life in Baltimore. And um, one of those great Baltimore situations where uh, I had both sets of grandparents living very close to me. My dad's mom lived across the street. My mom's parents lived right behind us. And then I had an aunt and uncle across the street. And the present day configuration of that is my sister lives in one set of grandparents' house. I live in another set. <laughs> and my aunt and uncle are still there. My parents are still there, thank God. And so um, what that meant for me as a young person was I could basically um, I had the run of the neighborhood and I would, I, I mean, I think mostly of going to my grandfather's house, my mom's parents and um, just running across the backyard back and forth all day, never having to knock, showing up, seeing what people are doing, and, you know, learning how to cook, how to garden, um, the stories of where we come from. All of my family comes from further south. Baltimore is part of the south, but my folks come from further south and they moved up here seeking work and a better quality of life. So um, the places that they come from, respectively, uh, really were part of my identity and how I understand the world and, you know, just the foods we eat and the accents. I, I thought my name was Ashley until I was like, you know, in middle school. Um, even today, sometimes I'll say a word and realize that I have accents from other places um, and and am very conscious of the fact that I now speak East Baltimore Lumbee ease. I know I have an accent, but uh, those folks telling me our stories and, and showing me the ways that they grew up and their parents grew up and on and on um, really influenced me. And then in my work as an artist, much of what I've done and what I continue to do is based on those stories and those ways of knowing and being. And um, the objective of what I do more often than not is to elevate those stories and those ways of knowing and being and, and to honor these people for the lives that they've lived and continue to live because um, quite often they, they don't think of what they've done and, and of uh, um, who they are as being anything extraordinary, but it really is. And I just think they deserve all the acclaim and um, also that our people need to be recognized because Baltimore is a weird place to be Indian. So yeah. I would love for you, this was not part of the plan, but I'd love for you to talk a little bit about the strangeness of being Indian in Baltimore. And I'm even going to equate it to urban environments, I think sometimes too, like Urban natives, I think, encounter specific challenges that sometimes other folks that are more ensconced in their communities may not necessarily encounter. Could you talk about what's weird about being an Indian in Baltimore for a second? Sure. So um, <laughs> we are on the east coast of the United States, and um, this is where contact happened. I mean, colonialism started on this side of the country and spread west, so we've been dealing with it a lot longer than people in other places. Um, to the fact that many times folks in cities like Baltimore forget that this is native land because they don't recognize native people around them. Um, we've been so, so thoroughly scrubbed from the uh, landscape. And so Baltimore is part of the ancestral homelands of the Susquehannock and the Piscataway peoples. 
um, Lumbee are not indigenous to Baltimore. Uh, my grandparents' generation moved up here um, by the thousands in the mid 20th century, again, seeking work and a better quality of life. And we actually do make up the majority of the American Indian population in this area today, but people don't expect um, us to look the way that we do or to live in houses or drive cars or speak English. And um, the United States is uh, uniquely obsessed with race in the world, right? It's one of the first things we notice about a person. So um, when people here encounter someone who they think is racially ambiguous, they ask silly questions like, what are you? Or worse, like they attack the person. And um, and we don't look, I mean, like most, most Native people don't look like uh, the Indians you see in movies or on TV, you know, prior to reservation dogs. So like, yeah, mm -hmm. we're just dealing with a lot of stereotypes and um, mythology about where, where we all live. And I appreciate the historical context, just re reminding us all that colonization started on this coast and spread west. And so that span of time and dealing with it as cities rose on the east coast, as communities were displaced and then migrated again for opportunities, it's really an important part of um, what is now known as United States history that sometimes just leaves our consciousness so easily in thinking about all of the things that we navigate here in this land. And I really appreciate this idea of um, acknowledging where your people are from and when they migrated seeking opportunity and it goes right back to those elders influencing you and then the work that you do now some of what I've gotten to know about you is really really elevating Lumbee stories as a geographic neighbor based in the Washington DC area I've gotten to see some of the coverage um, of your work um, that is not even just your work, it's the work of your people and making sure that their histories are acknowledged and print and, um, and celebrated and that their stories are heard. And you identify as a community-based visual artist. And so I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the practice of that and the mediums that that work takes form in. Sure, so uh, I was born an artist, I think, you know, all artists are, um, but it's also my vocation. And, um, and I was also like, everyone is born into community, right? Yes. Um, the, the West likes to glorify the individual artist genius, like they're this singular entity in the world, but we're never really without community, um, which is just the thing I need to say. I, I call myself that, I, that's what I got a degree, two degrees in. Um, but what it means, some, sometimes people call it social practice art. It's where what you what you do, what you make as an artist is in relation to community deliberately, usually for a purpose based on the wants or needs of the people you're working with. Sometimes it's in response to community. Um, and, and it's as much about process as it is about product. Um, it's about relationship building. Uh, there are questions of audience at the beginning, like what what media makes the most sense to, to convey what you're trying to convey. Um, I was trained in as a fine artist in painting, drawing, printmaking, all that good stuff. But you know, some of my best known projects have been photo projects because that's what the the groups I was working with, um, what media best suited what we were doing. Um, and, you know, like my last couple biggest projects were uh, the, the, the deliverables are like a brochure, a website and a cell phone walking tour. And they're really cool. And they're definitely my art. But um, again, like the, the process drove the form um, the content took and you know, that's what it is now. And, and, you know, yeah, it really varies. It depends. It depends a lot on the who. I love that because something that we were chatting about as we prepared for this conversation is that, um, in my opinion, something that I think Native artists bring to their work frequently is 
such a focus on process, product, getting to know folks, relationship building, that we may not even have a sense of what the product, the artwork, the presentation, the performance is going to be. We may not know form at the onset. And other artists from other communities work that way. Other identities work that way as well. But I think when our languages don't always identify art in the same way that a Western context does, but really centers community in the way that you started out our conversation with, um, there's something that's just really integrally linked to that sense of relationship building process and the unknown and discovery um, and building together. And I wonder if um, you could talk a little bit about how that might influence some of the other aspects of your work, because you also have been a curator, an educator, an arts administrator. Um, and so do you find that that community building and that, that artistic practice influences those other spheres and realms within which you work? I do. I, uh, I'm never not who I am, right? Like, and the older I get, I feel like the less of a filter I have or want to have when um, expressing my genuine thoughts and ideas about things, which can sometimes get me into trouble in institutions. But um, yeah, like, I was teaching American Studies courses as an artist. Um, you know, I approach my work as a curator at the Smithsonian as an artist who answers the community. Um, it's about accountability. Um, sometimes it's about trying to bend the, the schedules and the will of a very entrenched bureaucracy to, um, to accept like a more relaxed timeline or, you know, questions that don't have answers at the, at the outset. Um, I've actually felt so protective of some projects I've done. I've, I've done my best to do them outside of institutions because I just couldn't deal with all that, the constrictions and the, the fear that like um, we, the people working on the projects would lose autonomy over how they would go or what they could be or that they needed to be a certain thing or not, you know? But... Hmm. If you're comfortable, I'd love to dig into that a little deeper. I think that's a really important aspect of this work is when institutions um, create environments where artists are fearful of their um, the integrity of their work. I'll use that word, but it's many layers. It's many layers of representation of the voices that are part of that work. It's sometimes things like, I'm going to use a super Western term, like intellectual property rights kind of come up in a way. And that's such a Western frame of thinking, but knowing um, the many partners that are part of the National Performance Network, I think about, you know, these different perspectives that we all bring to this work. Um, are there things that could have created a stronger feeling of safety for you as an artist in those moments that might have allowed those projects to thrive in an institution? Are there yeah, ways of connecting with you as an artist that would have helped that you can think of? <sighs> That's a really good generative question. Um, I guess maybe um, if funding came through such that it weren't tied to a semester schedule or a fiscal year schedule, if it were over longer periods of time, if um, reporting requirements weren't similarly tied, uh, if people would just give a lump of money and say, do what you need to do with it, rather than forcing you to budget um, so specifically where every dollar is going to go when you don't even know how it's going to go. Um, yeah. Those kind of things. Oh, and now, if they would uh, make it easier to honor the folks contributing their expertise and their knowledge, the culture bearers of our communities, you, um, you actually, like I used to work for a state um, university, you cannot use those funds to purchase gifts. Gifting is a huge part of our culture. You know, um, you honor folks for their time. Also, like when honoring means an honorarium, like dollars, uh, the amount that's standard at those institutions is just deplorable. Um, so more generosity with time and money and control would be great. Yeah. And I so appreciate what you said about the timeline within which things need to happen. Uh, you know, a semester or a fiscal year 
and often you're writing about that a whole year in advance or sometimes even longer and then you get the notification that you can spend that money and by the time you get that notification you've got six maybe 12 months depending on the time cycle of things and and you haven't been able to start planning because you don't know if you have those funds yet. And then it has to end. And in terms of the ways we gather and the ways we want to build trust and community, that's just so not conducive to that. So funders take note. That's really some generous gems that you just shared. Thank you for veering from the course of our originally intended path. Sure. So uh, I have one last question for you. Um, the past two years, we've all been experiencing a lot of challenges, a lot of loss. Um, and as we think about gathering and all the opportunities, adaptations, invitations that have happened, is there something that you yearn for in future gatherings, hopefully in person, um, but maybe not, maybe other ways of gathering that you've missed or that you see the opportunity for us to collectively reimagine? What are you yearning for in gathering? Well, here locally, the first thing that came to mind, or even um, not locally in our tribal homeland, I really yearn for the opportunity to spend time with my elders and not not in fear of infecting them, of putting them in any kind of harm's way, and just being able to hug them and share food and, you know, listen to stories and um have a time that's that's what i really miss and uh what i really like to have but as far as work and artist gatherings i think um we could really reassess uh our product driven um systems that cause us to spend every second of every um every time that we have together in a pre-programmed way a very full agenda um, I think we could plan for more, more downtime, more open space technology, more just time to be with each other uh, or alone, you know, period, like reflect, silence, quiet. That's nice. Mm -hmm. um, in the midst of community activities, like uh, we could use a lot more of all those things and a lot less of busyness. It's amazing how busy we can be and still maybe not doing what we want to be doing, what our hearts, our guts, our instincts are yearning to do in the midst of all that busyness. Thanks for that invitation. Is there anything else you want to share or um, lift up as we start to wrap up this part of the conversation? I'm so grateful for your time and your feedback and ideas. I'm so grateful to be in conversation with you. You are one of my artistic heroes. <laughs> and um, if folks are more interested in learning about who I am and what I do, I do have a website. It's ashleyminnerart.com. And then if you want to see this latest project that we just rolled out, it's baltimorereservation.com. Excellent. Perfect, perfect. Well, thank you so much. And I look forward to the National Performance Network partners and artists getting to know you better. And um, I really appreciate your, your thoughts today. Thank you so much, Christopher. So meta, I'm in the same shirt in the same room, and yet it's different. So the incredible Ashley Minner, y'all, I'm really happy to have had that time with her. And a couple of things that um, resonate with me that I want to take away from that. So many gems of what she said, but a few things that I want to lift up is a reminder that process often drives form. And I believe I said in there, you know, that's not exclusive to Native artists, but anyone who's moving in circles that require community building, community input, and, um, and are working in long arcs, we often don't know what the form the project product is going to take at the end of a process. So that reminder that process often drives form. Acknowledging the importance of gifting culture in native communities. You know, it's so, so critical to integrate that in and to think about how we gather, how we break bread together. That's been so complicated with COVID, but um, food and sharing of gifts and how that fits into budgets that's a real challenge sometimes because sometimes grants don't allow for food expenditures or gift expenditures 
Um, and then the potential for funding and commissioning cycles to extend beyond a semester, a season, or a fiscal year. We've all experienced that, whether we're working for networks, venues, or individuals. So funders that are part of this and those that are in dialogue with funders and grant makers in the arts and all of those wonderful things, please keep pushing to expand the thinking around these short time frames that make true gathering, relationship building, and the speed of trust difficult to coincide with. And I just love that invitation for more open space technologies space for downtime and reflection. So before we move on to the next artist, I want to briefly address something that I think every Black, Indigenous, and person of color artist has been asked about when they attend a national conference. Our good old friend, cultural appropriation. So um, you'll see these thoughts in that same document that I shared with everyone. I wanted to make sure people really had a resource that they could leave with. But some Questions to consider in identifying cultural appropriation. What was the source material, the research process, and are they cited? Was credit and fi financial remuneration given to the appropriate community or person? Is someone from the dominant culture profiting while members of the borrowed culture are not being given equitable opportunities, support, or remuneration? And what is the history of the presenting institution, funder, exhibit, or opportunity that's being offered? How does the borrowed culture fit into that history? I know many of you and your institutions are far along in working on this and identifying this and taking action, but it feels like every time I'm at one of these gatherings, whether it's at the National Performance Network or perhaps Association of Performing Arts Professionals, the Western Arts Alliance, these other types of gatherings and dance that I'm often at, um, this conversation always comes up and I bet I'm not the only person of color that navigates this. So there's some questions to ask. And if, the cult, if you find that cultural appropriation is occurring, we can all, all of us, take action. Acknowledge the missteps. Those of you that are in the right position to commission artists, facilitate discussions, hire native facilitators or facilitators from the borrowed community. It might be appropriation from black community members, Latinx community members, and on and on. Shift the work and the funding to folks from the borrowed community. Invest in black, indigenous, people of color, queer, and disabled leadership. Invest in that leadership. We have seen shifts uh, from presenters and funders who have increasingly focused their support towards first voice creative projects. But you know, it wasn't long ago when it was seen as bold and risky for artists to tell the stories of marginalized air quotes around that communities. Communities that they were not from and for which they were handsomely rewarded by funders. So this legacy is why we need investment in black, indigenous, people of color, queer and disabled arts, artists and leaders. So next, we'll listen to part of the conversation that I had with Dakota Camacho, another incredible, incredible artist and leader and thinker. In addition to his interview as part of this session, Dakota leads a conference session later at 4 p.m., I believe, Eastern time today. Check your conference schedule, time zones. I'm not clear on right now because I'm focused on being here with you. So we're going to run um, Dakota's interview next. Aloha, my friend Dakota. So nice to have you with me for this conversation. Thank you for joining us. I wonder if you would mind beginning just by introducing yourself to our listeners today. Uh, my name is Dakota Camacho. 
I am Matha or Tsamoro from the islands of Laguas, uh, which is the ancestral name for what is momentarily known as the Marianas Islands. I am from the villages of Mongmong, Tomhom, and Hagatnya. And I also have lineage in Saipan, which is a little bit further back. Um, Saipan is one of the northern islands in our archipelago. I'm from the Tse and Egin clans, and I was born in the lands of the Snohomish and raised in the lands of the Snohomish, Swinomish, Swadab, and Dokta Opsh or Duwamish. Um, I use Gwiza and Zotnya as my pronouns. Um, they are in my language and they are gender neutral, which feels like um, holds space for all of who I am. Um, and yeah, I'm I'm a creative person. Uh, I'm a I'm a spirit that dances with the rain, um, that enjoys bringing people together. Um, I have been thinking about my creative practice as uh, multivalent. So I, I'm I'm inspired by valence electrons, which are the electrons in atoms that jump between atoms to balance the atomic structures. Uh, and I like to think that. Um, I like to think about my practice as that, as you know, tuning in to what kind of balance is needed in, in what kind of way and, um, and creating opening space um, for, you know, for that energy to come in. Yeah. That's such a great description of what I've come to know of you and your work. I definitely sense that listening and tuning into others and providing, offering balance in a lot of different situations. And over the past couple of years, I've found myself in different conversations with you. And I love that multivalent descriptor. I think it suits you very well from my experiences. Um, so some of our National Performance Network folks are going to be a little bit familiar with you. So I thought um, for those that do know you and those that don't know you, a way to get to know you better in this moment in time for everyone is I was curious if you could tell us a little bit about home. And I acknowledge that that is a word that has a lot of complexities, especially for Native and Indigenous folks who may have had different types of migration, immigration, uh, colonization happen to us. Um, and so I just really want to be expansive about that definition of home and invite you to meet me where you feel comfortable at with that. But if you could tell us a little bit about where you call home and the culture and family life that you have there. And again, an expansive definition of family, acknowledging that that is a word that can bring up lots of different things for different folks. Yeah, thanks. Thank you for that. Uh for the spaciousness of the question and acknowledging uh, at the forefront of asking it that, um, that there's so many ways in and out of it. I think that's such an important uh, way of being. Um, you know, in this time when um, sometimes questions um, are a lot more full than we give them credit for. Um, yeah, I. Um, and I think about home as many different places. Um, you know, you just heard some roosters um, crowing. I'm right now currently in Wuhan um, in my friend's home. Um, and I feel at home here. Um, and it's the land that my father grew up in, that my grandparents grew up in, that my great grandparents grew up in, um, generations and generations back. Um, there's a particular kind of family life here um, big extended families, um, you know, I, it, it's really hard to date here because you have to make sure you're not related. Um, you know, it's, um, it, it's really hard to date here as a queer person because <laughs> it gets even smaller. Um, <laughs> and, um, and there's, you know, there's a, a sense of responsibility to each other. That's, that's really beautiful. Um, and, and really full and responsibility to, to the land and there's the stories of um, how my ancestors, my uncles, my aunties, um, my Saina have related to this place um, is really gorgeous. And um, when I first came here, cause I, I didn't grow up here, um, the amount of people that could say, tell me stories about my grandparents or about my, my uncles and aunties or, you know, my, my family, like, hey, you know, this storefront here used to be a place where I would hang out with, with, your, with your grandparents, you know, and, um, or I used to play poker, you know, at, at this table and um, people really value that sense of longevity. Um, and I also call Seattle home. Um, it's a place where I've been, you know, rooted in for, for years. 
Um, and it's a place that nurtured me, you know, before I had a sense of what home was like here. Um, I, you know, I, I, I was raised by a really ethnically, culturally diverse place, um, you know, with a really rich history you know, of the Duwamish people, um, of Black people and Black cultural work. Um, you know, and of the legacy of immigrants that have been organizing uh, for for immigrant rights, you know, for um, the self determination of um, of migrant workers, uh, you know, a lot of Filipinos and um, Chinese, and uh, also multi ethnic like racial coalitions organizing for justice for our people, um, and so family life there. You know, even though my extended family and my cousins um, aren't in aren't in Seattle the way that I have cousins and family here in, in Guahan, family life there is also really big um, and expansive and includes the relationships with people that we've built, um, you know, over the years of being there uh, through organizing together, through making art together. Um, and yeah, and it's it. One thing that I think is really beautiful about people who move um, is some of us have this intelligence around making family wherever we're at mm -hmm. um, and making family with the place that we're at. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, when I'm when I'm in Coast Salish territory, there's a way that I relate to the mountains there. There's a way that I relate to the waters, to the wind, um, you know, even to the hills in my neighborhood. Um, and I feel really, I feel really close to that land in a different way that I feel really close to this land here. I love how you brought up the many different cultures that you were raised with and beside, because something that I reflect on a lot when I think about you is a really skillful way of navigating difference. Um, and I think that goes right back to the multivalence um, that you used as part of your introduction that I think is so appropriate. And so when I think about navigating differences and um, different cultures, I've witnessed a real sense, or I felt actually might be a better way to say it, when I've been in groups with you, different convenings, a real sense of clarity and intention in how you convene groups of people. And so I wonder when you think about that, are there specific moments when you began to notice approaches of gathering um, that influence the ways that you work, both just as a human and as an artist? Yeah, that's a beautiful, uh, a beautiful question. I've been reflecting on that a lot in the last few years in particular, um, because I've been, you know, I've been, I've been trying to kind of be clearer about my practice for myself. Um, and some of the things that have been coming up are just noticing the ways that I've been influenced um, throughout all of my life experiences. Um, you know, I grew up outside of my ancestral homeland and my Nana and Papa, my grandparents, my dad's mom and dad, um, they were cultural leaders that convened the Chamorro community to come together, uh, to fish together, to clam and crab, um, to live sustenance, um, I forget what they call it. Sus they, they farmed, you know, they hunted, they fished um, together with the Chamorro community and brought people together and then and in a traditional kind of way, split up the catch, made food. Uh, my nana was a Tetsa, so she uh, she would lead the prayers for the funeral funeral rites in our community. My papa is a legendary chef. My uncle died, um, you know, kind of um, uh, a few months into COVID. And my auntie was like, I still remember your papa's clam chowder, you know? Um, we had huge family gatherings. So I, in, in some ways I relate to being here in Guahan and the cultural practices here because we continue those. Um, and all of that, you know, um, my family's dance group growing up, um, you know, bringing people together around food and art, creativity, storytelling, uh, prayer. You know, those are all really fundamental to my practice today. And I'm also informed by growing up in, in Seattle and having connections to the South and of Seattle, to the Central District of Seattle, and um, bearing witness to and being a part of the, the way that hip hop culture um, was being made there, right? That um, I'm influenced by gathering people around us around a cipher um, around uh, col the collective energy of learning how to uh, learning how to know when it's your time, learning how to listen 
to, to another person's story and, and, and feel the energy and participate in it. Um, you know, learning how to, to be honest about who you are and what you bring to the circle. Um, you know, and in that time was also, you know, like lots of big organizing energy, you know, I mean, my introduction to, to hip hop is that it's, it, hip hop is a tool for community organizing. It's a tool for community healing, right? Um, these are also things that I think about my Nana and my Papa gathering our community around. Um, and, you know, and as I've kind of been on this journey of deepening my understanding of what my role is, you know, what's my responsibility um, in this body, in this set of experiences, um, you know, there's been, there's been a number of moments where I feel like I've been guided by those community principles and also by the way that particular people um, initiate people coming together. And I think that there's a sense of, um, of bravery that it takes to, ins to insist that this is your cultural way of doing things and this is the way that it's going to be when, um, and, and, and in my experience, um, part of that bravery is kind of doing the work almost beforehand to let your heart break. Um, hmm. to let your heart break around the resistance that might come up for people mm. um, around the, um, the sudden sense of dislocation that, that people might feel when you say, um, I want to take a moment to acknowledge this place that we're in. You know, some people, when, when you gather um, in, across many different experiences, some people have never done that. Um, and, and some people have done that. And maybe their way of doing it is different than yours, right? So also, how are you leaving, you know, leaving space um, for, you know, for other ways of being uh, to enter? And I, I think about, um, I feel like one of the kind of biggest inspirations in my life has been this elder named Squai Kwai, who's Swinna Mission Shwadab, um, who I started building relationships with when my community decided to bring back um, to we initiate our um, creation story ceremony, our New Year ceremony. Um, and I just saw this, I mean, what I think about is a really humble and beautiful way of sharing himself. Hmm. You know, this is, he, like, I, I hear him say, like, this is who I am and, and this is how we do things in, in my community. Um, and I think that there's, 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 there's such a beauty of that. And, and I've really, I've, I've let moments like that, like, with him and in different indigenous communities and, you know, different communities in, in uh, you know, in, in many different places across the world where it's like the power of song, the power of vibration, the power of, of breath is palpable and, um, and it's transformative, you know? And it, it's that, it, that it, it's the feeling of, of, trans, it, of the possibility, the potency of transformation, of expanding the mind beyond what we even can see is possible. That's what inspires me. That is what I am, I, I just feel called to cultivate moments where we can bear witness to that within, within ourselves, where we can hold space for that uh, with each other. There's so many strong strands of everything you just shared. There's, you know, gathering and a sharing of food of sustenance of um i for a second i thought you were going to start talking about like sustainable farming practices and um environmental ecology you know which is at the heart of so many indigenous practices right but these are these western terms that have now um been um surfacing in these ways so there's you know food and gathering and sharing and and communal work that has joyfulness to it and sustenance in it and then there's sort of different approaches of of uh, you know, circles and circularity. And sometimes that's the physical circle of the cipher, but sometimes there's other ways that we can balance a space with circularity. And I think in this age of virtual gathering, I, I think a lot about how does a space become circular in 2D? And I think it can. Um, and I think it's so much about the spaciousness that you're offering, leaving space that no one approaches the approach, but if you offer your approach and leave space for others, that's a strong principle that I'm gathering from what you said. And then this idea of the sharing of self, and um, I'm going to add a word to it if it's okay, which is vulnerability. Like folks who are willing to put themselves out there, and bravery was the word you used, which to me sometimes relates to a vul making oneself vulnerable. And um, I think a lot of... Um, 
Western forms value that in performance. You know, the artist on stage who makes themselves vulnerable in front of an audience. And I'm always curious about like, how is that supported and sustained throughout process? Relationship building, gathering. Um, there's so many times where we're asked to be strong and that's beautiful and wonderful and part of um, the dialectic that we live in, but then also the space for bravery and vulnerability um, is really interesting to me. And so many other things that you shared. Um, started to spark and connect to another place that I want to go to, which is um, as I've gotten to know your work over the years, I've seen you work both within and completely outside of institutional support. And by institutional support, I mean venues that we think of in terms of presenting performance, visual art, etc., but also funding structures as well. Um, and so I'm curious, as you reflect on the different experiences you've had, both within and without of institutions, um, what are some moments where you felt really supported by folks or an institution, folks in an institution or that institution, um, that you feel like might just benefit the field a little bit? You know, interestingly, the first thing that comes up is um, when we we did, so I was a part of a, I, I, I was one of the co-founders of this arts collective called I Moving Lab, um, which was international, indigenous, intercultural, and interdisciplinary. And our tagline for a long time was we do different things in different places with different people. And it was really true. Um, and we did this tour once in, in Hawaii um, that was completely unfunded um, by funders. Um, we did a GoFundMe uh, to help pay for some of the artist flights. Uh, the artists that came basically volunteered their time because we, we didn't pay anybody um, with money. Um, we created a set of experiences um, that we thought would be valuable to each of our creative, cultural, personal growth. Um, and, you know, we did, we, we did things like we went and volunteered um, at the Hawaii Nature Center in Oahu. Um, we did a pop-up show inside of uh, an old shopping mall that's now torn down. Um, and, um, you know, we, we got to have an experience at the Bishop and then we traveled to different islands. Um, and the moment that I was thinking about when you asked that question was actually when um, we were welcomed um, to the Hawaii Community College. Um, and I think it was also, I, I never understand the relationship between HCC and UH Hilo. I, it just kind of confounds me, but there's a band there named Tokori Tangaro and he welcomed us with a welcoming ceremony um, that they had been cultivating as a part of the curriculum of that place, of that community college for years. It's the continuation of his wife's mother's work. Um, and I mean, that level of support of being really fully welcomed, of having our ancestors be saying, yes, ancestors come and be with us, have an exchange with us, learn with us, make something with us. Um, and we were having, we were having really deep conversation like through our hearts. And this is now a man that I have, you know, I can call up and be like, hey, um, there's some things going on in my life. I really want to ask you about them, you know? Um, and so, you know, I mean, that level of institutional support, I think is just, you know, I'm, it's in some ways, I mean, unheard of in in terms of the other kind uh, uh the other kinds of institutions non-indigenous institutions mm -hmm. um you know and 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 so I, th I i think that there's something there around the possibilities that open up when you back indigenous leadership yes. um there was another there was another example that i think about you know i've been cultivating this relationship with on the boards um and which is a theater in Seattle. And they selected my work for their Northwest New Works Festival um, back in 2019, I think. Was that before the pandemic? I don't even know. It sure was. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so, and and when when they curated my work, um, you know, I, I, I said, they gave me 20 hours of rehearsal space to make this 20 minute work. And I said to them, um, I wanna use all of that um, by teaching community classes. Um, and they said, sure, you know, 
um, you know, bring, bring, bring your folks in. Um, and then I said to them, I, I can't have you produce my work in your festival um, without at least on the nights where I'm presenting my work, acknowledging the protocol of this place. Um, and here's what I've been taught about what the protocol is. Um, and they said, okay. Um, and part of that protocol, the way that I was taught in um, Coast Salish territory is, you know, acknowledging the, the space and the place, acknowledging the ancestors um, through song. Um, part of what I learned from Squai Kwai is that it would also be good to talk about the history of, of the place and how our presence there is a part of a story of um, of a system that is negatively impacting the lives of the people who are who are genealogically responsible for taking care of that place and the and the beings that call it home, right? And to share about how even the presence of, of Seattle, the city of Seattle, the presence of on the boards is negatively impacting the Duwamish. And so then you you know you share this is the way I was taught. You share a bit about that, you know you share about the song and 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 how the song is an acknowledgement of the ancestors and then you asked people to make an offering from you know from the openness of their heart to the people of the land and um the way it was explained to me is that um you know um in the time before paper money um people would give of their land right they would give shells and it and it's it's a way of of resourcing the people to, 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 do, to do even more to take care of that land. And so on the board said, sure, we can do that. And, and we, we ended up passing um, on the nights where my work was being presented, we ended up, I, we ended up doing all of that and then passing out, um, passing a, a hat around and asking people to donate. On the boards took it a step further, um, which is throughout the entire festival, they did a land acknowledgement and and asked people to to do, to donate from their hearts to the people of the land um and and then at the end of the festival we took all of that down um to to the duwamish longhouse and, and and we we gave that that resource to them and we explained to them where it came from and 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 why we were doing that and what teachings that it came from you know um and and i you know, I, I, to me, that was one of the deepest ways that they could support my work, uh -huh. because as an indigenous artist, um, who who from in our own land, we have our own protocol of how we relate to land and water. It's 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 actually an expression of my identity to respect the protocol of another land. It's an expression of who I am to affirm uh, the law of that place, um, and you know. I mean, I, I I still think that that's uh, you know that's a that's in some ways a, a drop in the bucket <laughs> of of mm -hmm. of the work that is necessary. You know, I, I'm I'm still waiting for um, people who own land to just literally give it back. Um, you know, and and to commit to backing native leadership. You know, um, thank you. Mahalo so much for sharing a bit about yourself, your work, um, your perspective with all of us. I'll make sure that um, your website and your Instagram are dropped into the chat so people can continue to follow your work. But would you tell us all a little bit about the exhibit if we happen to be in the Southern California Long Beach area, yeah. Tongva Land? Yes, so if you're in Tongva territory, um, the greater Los Angeles area, um, then you can visit and experience some of the work that we're working on um, with that group of uh, Mac Alex Moral artists. Um, we have a space at the Pacific Island Ethnic Art Museum, um, which is called Mali'i Fan Hasudan. Um, and it is 13 of, our, of, of us telling parts of our life story through art and their stories of of love, love for our lands, uh, for our ancestors, of you know our ancestors like traveling deep into the sea, uh, the impact that colonization and land desecration is having on our bodies, 
um, you know, like literally causing some of us to to seize up, to go to go into seizure. There's stories of um, you know ancestral connection from from way back of people who are making patterns out of the colors of the sunrise here. Um, you know of um, of women celebrating natural lineage um, through the practice of of dudus, which is like feeling good and looking good. Right, and how that is also an expression of, of connection to land, right? Um, that the body becomes a um, becomes a canvas for the for the land to be present mm. for us too. Uh, you know, there's there, and so much more, and so much more. That's just the, the tip of the iceberg. So if you check out the Pacific Island Island Ethnic Art Museum, um, you can go and visit, and um, yeah, and. Also, you know, the, there's a there's a piece of, of this that I think is relevant to this conversation, which is that um, the opening of that exhibit, the first piece that you encounter, um, is an acknowledgement of the protocol of that place. Mm. And the first first thing that you'll hear when you enter into this exhibit, from mapped out Tomorrow artists from islands far, far, far away from Tongva territory, the first thing that you're going to hear um, is a Tongva song. Um, and I think that that's, I think that there, there's some, there's something there and there's so much more we could say about that, but I, mm -hmm. I'll just, I'll say that much for now. Well, thank you once again, mahalo nui loa for being with us. Mirai ma'asi. So something I want to lift up from the discussion with Dakota is his use of the term multivalence and its relationship to intersectionality. He is part of many different communities, as are all of us. And in this time where there are so many identity affinity groups, things that are very needed, those groups are very needed, meaningful and important. We also cannot erase that most of us carry a multitude of identities. Our EDI work, our equity, diversity, inclusion work, and all of those other acronyms for that work, uh, our racial justice and social justice trainings, our programming, our gatherings, all need to include and remember intersectionality as well. So even though this had this session, this keynote had this specific indigenous focus, um, I really wanna lift that up as well. None of us are monoliths. And just like each gathering is unique and requires unique preparation, each of us, each of you, are utterly unique and complex. I know you know this, but it's just really worth lifting up in these moments of doing a lot of work at a quick pace. In many of our arts nonprofit and social justice circles, we have had discussion after discussion, panel after panel on native representation and issues, on EDI work, on inclusive curatorial practice, upending the funding systems. I've been speaking with colleagues lately, and at the beginning of this session, I mentioned you know, the exhaustion that I imagine we all feel. And if you're fatigued by this EDI work, if that's you, me, I understand that. I feel that. I empathize with you, excuse me. The work can be challenging. It's tiring. We might need rest from it. And I invite you to buckle in for more and to do so with compassion and grace and your art heart. Perhaps we can find joy in this work as we forge new bonds and ways of working together. Gatherings that are mindfully informed by indigenous values, disability justice, LGBTQIA pride, Black joy, Latinx power, intersectionality, and so much more. I'm so inspired and motivated by the work of NPN. Caitlin's update was so powerful and meaningful to me. How can we expand from building bridges to creating whole new worlds, new futures? Finally, I must acknowledge some people whose work advice, words, wisdom have influenced my preparation for today's session. Choreographer and native activist, Rosie Simas. Ty Defoe and Larissa Fasthorse of consulting firm Indigenous Directions. Lulani Arquette and Ruben Rokenyi of the Native Arts and Cultures Foundation. Vicky Holt-Takamine of Pai Foundation. 
Kumuhula Elsie Ryder and Kumuhula Patrick Makuakane. These are some great thinkers, leaders that have really influenced my thinking and even the document that I shared with all of you that I hope is a meaningful resource for some of you. I want to thank our ASL interpreters, Kate and Juniper, and our cart captioner, Jody. You know, we always make these friends in the digital realm really quickly, and then we part ways. And mahalo nui loa, thank you very much for giving me the space to share with you for a little while, and these other incredible artists, Ashley and Dakota. Love and shout out to the tech team who did a fantastic job with my session. I know you've just begun. Good luck, y'all, for a great conference. Again, mahalo nui loa. Have a wonderful conference, and I look forward to more conversation and work with each and every one of you.